Welcome to a brand new podcast series here on Squash Skills that we're calling Under the Tin. We're going to be speaking to different people at different levels of the game who make up the fabric of the sport. We want to seek out different perspectives to understand the challenge that squash is currently facing, both before and as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So today I'm delighted to welcome the chairman of Avon Squash, Seamus Singh, to have a chat about what's going on in Avon, what's going on at a club and county level. So thanks for joining us today, uh, Seamus. How, how is the squash community looking in Avon at the moment? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, it's been challenging. I've been chairman now for about four years. Um, when I took over, the committee was very small, um, just a couple of people doing all the jobs and i think one of the first things i kind of focused on was to try and broaden a the membership of the committee so have more people doing stuff but also have it from a wider number of clubs so at the time when i took over i think there were just two clubs involved out of the 16 or 17 we've got um it's still the case that too many members of our committee come from a very small group of clubs but we've now got four clubs involved um in that um we're still short on diversity so we've only got one woman on the committee um no juniors involved or you know no participation or representation from juniors for example um i think one of the biggest things i found in my time is that clubs are doing stuff on their own there's little little collaboration between them and that's not a criticism that's just the fact of how things are they are working in isolated pockets trying to do the best they can for the mayor members and in their venues. Um, so at a committee level, at a county level, it's really difficult to try and get a consistent engagement between us and the clubs to then just try and develop the game. And do you um, think that's in- indicative of all counties or is that a kind of an even issue? Or do you think, have you spoken to other, other counties that are experiencing? Well, I've heard the same thing from other counties. I think that's pretty in- in- endemic across the country. Yeah. Um, there will be pockets where that interaction is beginning to grow and get and getting much better. But even in those places, so you know, I've had chats with, for example, Middlesex, where that is beginning to change. But even then, there is still a large group of clubs who aren't engaging for whatever reason. And and, and again, that's not a criticism. That's just an observation of, of how things are. Um, um, so I mean, let's just dive into how you see squash in Avon at the moment in terms of participation numbers, both in terms of juniors, adults, court closures, yeah. club closures, you know, just paint, paint a picture of where we're at and maybe how it compares to perhaps 10 years ago. What's your, what's your perception? So we've seen, um, in terms of inter-club leagues, we've got about four to 700 players possibly playing. Um, that number has dropped a little bit, and particularly with women, that number has, has just dived. Um, right. It's really done almost virtually to nothing. Um, in our junior program, we probably are engaging across three of the clubs with 60 to 80 juniors of varying abilities. So those are from right beginners all the way through to people who are maybe doing bronze level tournaments at England squash. Um, you know, if I were to look at the stats, I'm not sure how many of those juniors, particularly the more able ones, are actually even playing inter inter club league. Um, they don't seem to be graduating into competitive play at that level yet, um, and I'm not sure why. In terms of courts, um, a lot of our courts are in leisure centres, so we know that there's a, a real problem with the support of those clubs in leisure centres. They're they're very isolated. They get little support from the management of the leisure centre, they're just seen as a group of people who are running a squash club inside that. And so for them to put on events, for them to put on social activities is, is almost virtually impossible because they'll get no support from the venue to run those kind of events. Mm. So, you know, in a lot of our a lot of our leisure centres, the courts are in poor condition. They don't get furnished. Um, you know, there's little information. There's almost almost no coaching going on there. Um, then you get our private members clubs, you know, like Redland, Lansdowne, Workout, where you know, there's a strong squash community and therefore the engagement is a lot better, a lot more support. There's probably another group of players who are playing the game a lot, but we don't have any interaction with them. We don't seem to be able to 
to get that interaction. And those people are playing box leagues at lunchtime, um, you know, maybe coming from businesses in the local area to a club that's running a box league. Um, they may not even be members of England squash, so we don't get any financial rebate from that. But again, see them outside of that. No one's talking to them. No one's finding out what it is they want. And, and, and that's a, a real problem for us in the county is to how to engage with those people. And then the numbers you, definitely have been dropping over the last five or six years. Yeah. And then, I mean, obviously from an active kind of group of coaches in the county, obviously Elite Squash with, with Hadrian is, is based there and he's got a couple of coaches working underneath him. But how many active coaches are there yeah. kind of within the county then at the, the different clubs? What's the, the reality of the situation? So I know that there's I know that uh, there's one one at Redland. Rose Bamber is doing great work over at uh, Redland, eleven three qualified coach. Um, Hadrian with the lead has got one, two, three, four, four or five of us doing coaching. So like I do the Sunday minis. Um, Steve Thompson does um, work at workout. Hadrian kind of focuses on the pros, but does some other work. And John's looking after UE and also um, Lansdowne. And then there'll be some minor coaches, you know, there's some coaches who are level two doing this, you know, assisting on programs, probably, probably three or four other, other coaches like that in the county. So, we you know, probably around 10 active coaches mm -hmm. in the county working on existing programs. And do you feel, I mean, do we feel that's an, enough or do we feel we really need more to see the game growing or like it, what's... It's, it's definitely not enough. I mean, if you were to look at trying to put coaches into the leisure centers, for example, where there's no engagement. And, you know, I was looking at the, um, the clubs that we have. There's about seven schools that are attached to a court, whether they're public schools or private schools. But there's no coaching going on there. There's no program exist, existing inside those schools making use of the courts that are literally 50 yards away. Mm. And that's that's down to a lack of coaching and being available and, and being willing to go in there and build the programs from, from nothing. So it, it's a lack of coaches in the county, but then a lack of funding being available to get coaches. I guess it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. It, it, it's definitely that. We, we know that, for example, Rose and Hadrian have tried to, to do this before and what they've run into the at the leisure centers, there's always very massive fees to have the courts blocked out to be able to run the programs. And if you don't get the numbers in, you don't get kids paying for those courts, then it's not financially viable for the coaches to actually run those. And we know schools are, are strapped for cash at the moment, so they're reluctant to want to pay for putting these sessions on, mm. um, which is why we find a lot of primary schools outsourcing their PE to third parties to just deliver content using the budget that they've got so what's this what's i mean what do you think the ideal kind of solution is here like what do we we need to be accessing funding or finding innovative ways of funding these roles within the county presumably yeah i think it's, it's a combination of trying to find um you know and everyone's having this problem trying to find sponsors who are willing to, to help fund programs, finding new ways to raise money in the county. So not looking at traditional funding streams like match fees and stuff like that. There must be other ways to do fundraising, um, crowdsource funding, um, running lotteries, you know, things like that, that, that nobody in this county wants to think about doing. They just want to look at how can we raise fees and our existing rebates. Um, you know, we are looking at the Middlesex model of creating a subscription program for our existing juniors, but that's not going to help go wider than the existing junior program that we've got, but it would be a start, mm. which then would allow us to use that kind of funding that we do have elsewhere. And what about the, yeah, the squash community itself? Do we really need to be looking at kind of further membership fees at county level i guess people are playing membership fees at club level and then they're paying membership fees to england squash potentially through their clubs or often it's folded in right but yeah 
It, it, that it, does happen. I know there are other counties who charge an extra levy for their members to play, which they use for the development program. Um, and any months that some counties charging are, you know, maybe five pound ahead to more than that. Some of them have really increased their team fees to to help cover that off. You know, our fees for team membership are way are much lower than some of the other counties are, for example. Um, when we tried, for example, to raise fees by just one pound a couple of years ago, we got real pushback on that. Um, so there is this kind of barrier to try and overcome. And obviously, we're not selling the idea of why we want to, to increase fees or charge extra fees. We're not doing a good enough job at committee level to present that as an argument and make people go, yeah, I can see why we should do that and why I should participate and be willing to to chip in more money. So, I mean, how, where do you see the game of squash then at the moment? If you're, you know, being honest, how do you see it at a kind of, I guess, a grassroots level? What's your perception, you know, I guess within the UK or, yeah, certainly locally, like, would you say it's healthy or do you think we're struggling? Do you think we're failing? Like, what's, what's your honest assessment of the current situation? Locally, it's stagnant, so it's it's just maintaining a status quo. Everyone talks about we want to grow the game, but there's little clear direction on how we can do that. Um, no clear strategy, no clear method of doing that. We we want to try, and and COVID got in the way of being able to try a lot of those ideas out. You know, it's a lot of trial and error to see you know what's going to work and what isn't going to work, given that we have limited funds. So we don't want to waste large amounts of money doing expensive marketing campaigns that generally won't produce a lot. So we were going to try you know, a lot of little programs. At a national level, again, it feels like we're stagnating. And it feels like we got into a, me a negative mindset where we have this perception, and it's true that we've lost a lot of courts, we've lost a lot of players since the heyday of, this, of the 70s and 80s. And it's almost like we got into this mindset that that's how it is. And mm -hmm. We've got to do whatever we can to stop the rot. But I guess my feeling is that we're not looking at really radical ways of changing the growth of the game. So if you were to look at um, other sports, I had it in my mind, you know, golf, even golf, which is a great successful game, is looking at new ways to try and generate excitement new tournaments, new st styles of, of, of format of play. Um, the same with some of the other sports that, that are in, you know, particularly minority sports are looking at ways to speed up the game. Cricket is a really good example. I mean, test cricket is the pinnacle of the game, but we're now coming down to a point where they're going to introduce a hundred ball version of the game. And who'd have imagined that 20 years ago? Because, you know, they're, they're losing their base. People don't want to come and spend six, seven hours watching a game it's you know our, our attention spans are very very short um and so i think we need to look at how can we make the game faster shorter but still fun um and that kind of flies in the face of what we all like is in the traditional version of the game so you know hi-ho is gone for a lot of people and a lot of people are missing it we're now into point and point of rally um in my county we're playing 15 point rally in, 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 in the lower divisions. And personally, I don't like it. I prefer the 11. I think it just needs to be shorter, sharper, and, and much more aggressive. Um, but that's just how I am. I mean, I've quite often tossed around with the idea of, can we play social tournaments where it's actually a timed game? Um, you know, it's not first 11. It's just how many points can you get in 10 minutes, regardless of your ability? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Yeah. I think there's no need. The game's great in its purest form, right? We know when we watch a great squash match and it's a long five setter and it's good squash. It's it's so engaging and enthralling. And I don't think we need to lose lose that. That's what squash. The, the game is good. No, there's a version. I think you're right. There's this potentially an alternative version that is shorter, sharper one day tournaments at an amateur level, multiple games in a day, um, kind of shootouty type stuff. I mean, it's not the second time I've mentioned this in this series of podcasts, but 
overarm serves going into the front quarter rather than rather than to the back quarter, get the game off on an attacking foot footing. Um, you know, whether it's shorter scoring, best of threes, you know, who knows what that is, but you know, it, it's definitely something that that could be considered it's not taking away from that pro game you know that's we all know what squash is and there's a you know the full-on competition version definitely i mean well i mean what we found with our flagship tournaments um so these are the traditional forms of the game which is you know best of five close county championships with running over a weekend and, and we're finding now that a lot of people are finding it difficult to commit to a, a weekend i mean a, a tournament used to start on a friday and finish on a Sunday afternoon. And a lot of them are finding it difficult to commit even just to a, a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, particularly some of our women who are, you know, looking after kids, looking after families. They want everything done in a day. Well, um, you know, and during our last close tournament, we were trying to bundle up blocks of time. So that was, this is the women's time. Only women will be playing during this time. So they could just go, okay, I know I've got two or three hours when I get maybe two or three matches in. Mm. Um, and that's another constraint because you know, you, ten years ago, everyone would go, "Yeah, I'm happy to give my weekend." Well, that's not the case anymore. What do you think has driven that change, that shift in ten years? Um, I think it's, you know, particularly those who've got families. Our kids have got so much more opportunity to do things on the weekend than they did twenty years ago. So more rugby clubs, more net ball sessions, more hockey things happening. So all these kids are doing stuff. They're doing gymnastics, they're doing skateboarding. I've had people drop out of my junior program because they've got rugby in the morning on a Sunday. Um, the opportunity for our kids is so much greater than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm. And so their time is limited and they're naturally going to start choosing the things that they find the most engaging and the most fun. So kids going off to rugby are meeting a large number of kids. They're all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're playing against each other. So you'll get 11 players aside, 15 aside, playing against each other, having fun. Squash, the most you can put on to play a game at that age is two to play a game. You wouldn't, put, you wouldn't want to put them playing doubles at that age. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that, that then becomes a barrier and kids then will find themselves standing around waiting for their turn to do things. And that's not a great environment. I mean, I've seen that happen in cricket where if a coach isn't involved, the kids get disengaged. Mm. And, you know, I've been to programs where actually it's the parents who are doing a lot of the coaching because the, parent, the, the main coach is running around between 30 kids. Um, you know, and that's, that's not a great experience either. No. They're earning money, but it's not a great experience for the kid. No, sure. It's got to be um, fun. You know, speaking to Mick Todd, it's, you know, you, it, he just emphasized the need to get kids in playing competitively against a wall, hitting a ball against a wall. Don't worry about the lines. Don't overcomplicate it. Just get people running around. And, and that competitive element is what we love about squash, chasing a ball. It comes back off the wall, but it's, it has to be fun. Um, and like I said, we were talking about juniors there, but what's and what's your take on kind of young adults and how how are we doing as a county in terms of bringing young adults into the game or beginner adults to the sport? What's what's going on? What's your perception at that kind of twenty two post grad or even university students to thirty? You know. Yeah. So. I mean, we're lucky we've got three universities in our area and there, there are strong programs in each of those universities. Um, and the chats that I've had with them seem to be that they do very well at the beginning of the term when loads of people want to come and play and get on court. And then for some reason, they lose a lot of players who don't return. Um, and we think that's because a lot of what then happens in the universities is focused around competition. And so... There's little for those who aren't interested in competition mm -hmm. in terms of just social play. Uh, and one of the interesting things was, was um, I turned 60 last year and, and I ran a tournament down at a uh, workout in celebration of that. But I made it a non-competitive team type event. So teams of five turned up and one person would play squash, one person would play racquetball, and some people would play table tennis at the same time. And they got a chance to rotate. And everybody played their particular version of that activity for 15 minutes. 
total number of points scored. Um, and that lasted the whole day. And we had a lot of kids from the university. And, and one of the things they said about that was it was one of the most fun events they've been to, A, because it wasn't competitive, B, because they got to try events that they wouldn't normally get to try, but it was social. Mm. They had a great time talking to people. They met people who weren't part of the university. And they basically said, if you could organize more events of like that around the county, we would go to any club that's doing that and support it. Right. You know, so, um, explain in detail again how it worked then in terms of going from squash to racquetball to table tennis and timed, what was the actual format? Yeah. So, so I'd have team A versus team B and there'd be three players playing. So one of, the, one of their team members would be on the squash court, another one would be on another court playing racquetball. And the third member would be downstairs um, playing table tennis. And the other two members were probably drinking at the bar, having a chat, yep. you know, or, or supporting their teammates. And they would get 15 minutes. So we would blow a whistle and they'd get as many points as they possibly can in their particular discipline. And then we would top them up. Right. And at the end of the day, somebody won a funky little prize in each of the categories. We had an A grade and we had a B grade and whatever. Um, and they just had a ball and then we had a party afterwards. We had a, a barbecue, um, some food put on, which, you know, I paid for because it was my birthday. So no one had to pay for it. Um, and then we had a, you know, some music on and, and they just loved it and they stayed and, and I've got a great time. We had about 50, 50 people involved. Yeah, um, and I think that's, and I think that's the way to go in terms of coming out of COVID. I'm not against competition. I really am a strong believer in the traditional leagues, traditional tournaments. But I think we have to go down the social route. I think we definitely have to go down and create social interaction, things where competition isn't important. So we had people who had never played squash or never played racquetball go on and have a go. And the yeah. person who was playing them may have been a very experienced, but they realized that the person they were playing wasn't having a go, and they just made sure they had a good time. So we had nine-year-olds on court up to 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds playing table tennis, chopping everybody to bits. <laughs> yeah, Clive. <laughs> um, yeah, that was Clive. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's really interesting a multi sport concept there. You know, pulling in racquetball as well because then immediately you know the ball's bouncing, isn't it? People are going to get extended rallies. They're getting that experience of squash, but then they're getting the game of squash as well. And then obviously, I mean, workouts unique in that. Well, relatively unique in the amount of table tennis courts. Oh, the, the, the yeah, lot there, but you know, racquetball, squash, some other activity, plus the bar. It's a, it seems like a bit of a, uh, an easy win, right? Um, and sounds... Yeah, I mean, I, wonderful. I could see us going out and, and just, you know, taking a fourth event out into Queen Square and, and setting up a, a badminton or volleyball net mm. uh, and just making that another event. Um, you know, there's loads of things that you can attend because only like a two-minute walk. Um, it's like a great taster session as well, isn't it? As a concept, you know, get four sports involved, three, four, five sports, and it's just come and have a go. You know, it's something that you know, plenty of clubs will have different activities available to them, won't they? Some will have access to a badminton court, others might have access to a dance studio, whether, you, but whatever, you know, whatever you set up, it can be, yeah, let's try this sport, let's make it fun, let's make it social. Um, and you've always got squash and racket. I mean, the key thing with all these things. I mean, the key thing with all these things is that you're trying to create an, a lifestyle experience. So it's not just go and have 40 minutes exercise on the court. I think that argument is over overstated. Mm. Um, you know, we talk about the number of calories that people can burn playing squash, but in reality, Joe Public is never going to get anywhere near that because they're not good enough. Mm. But at the same time, they can go on there and have fun. Um, we want to see, I mean, squash is one of those things about squash is it always had a great after game atmosphere. So like a, you, you go into workout, for example, and a lot of people going into the gym classes, they go into the class, they get showered, they go home. The squash players go in, play squash, get showered, go downstairs and have a chat. Mm. And that part is so important. It's so vital to, to the health of any community, that social interaction, the, the, the idea that we go out and, even at league level, we're going off and meeting other people and we sit down and socialize and have a meal afterwards and we actually chat to each other mm. and, you know, debate Brexit, which is, you know, fun back in, when that was happening. Um, 
So again, it's, it's you know one of the things that we're looking to do in the county when we come out of Brexit is creating these environments where people can come and have this social interaction, and through that get exposure to the game, get exposure to people who can point them how to to get better, to create funded programs for women only for you know getting our beginners sorted out. One of the things that we're doing is that we're providing equipment for new juniors. They're not asking exactly them to, put, to get their own equipment and we'll provide it for them. Yeah. We're going to do the same for the women's programs. Um, we're looking at a, a, um, equipment amnesty programs so that maybe we can go to the leisure centers and go, you don't have to keep buying rackets. We'll help supply those rackets from our amnesty program. Yeah, I had we'll this educate you on. I had the same conversation with Alan Thatcher yesterday about, you know, everybody. If you're a squash enthusiast, there's probably most people have probably got four or five rackets lying around that are old that all they need is re- to be regripped, right? You know, in this yeah. post COVID days, get a sponsor on board, get Dunlop or Caracol to, to provide a load of, of grips. Each racket gets regripped, and then people don't have to go and use a bent out shape aluminium racket, you know, and even give these rackets okay. away to beginners if somebody joins the club incentivize it you know if a beginner says oh if they play three times or they say i'm going to join the club well you get a free racket here it is it's second hand but it'll keep you yeah. going for a little while lowering that barrier to right. it's complete sense and the, the other thing i've seen a lot in it um i mean how many times would you would you go see what you would call beginners or novices on court hitting with the incorrect ball yeah it's trying to hit with a double yellow ball on the cold court it's no wonder they don't want to come back yeah no, 100%. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny, the same topics are starting to crop up in these conversations. Um, it's, yeah, the wrong ball and, and barrier to entry and it not being fun. It's people aren't going to come back a, a second time. So there's got to be early education and the, the right equipment's got to be available for people to to use. Um, I mean, coming back to the, the short form events, you, you in Avon, I know with the elite squash we had the the elite series, didn't we? The one day events. What was your yeah. of those as well? I'm trying to talk us through how how that worked. Well, I thought they, I thought they were absolutely brilliant. I mean, they were focused at obviously, obviously they're focused at the dedicated player, the one who's, who's desperate to play. But the fact that it all happened in one day was fast. It was it was exciting. There was a lot of buzz. People were downstairs chatting, um, and that's what yeah, that's what you want, mm-hmm. you know. The, it's completely different from the traditional three-day tournament over the weekend, which is, has a slower pace. People can come and go. Nobody left. Everybody was there because they're going to be on court again in, in 40 minutes' time or 50 minutes' time. They were reffing. They were watching exciting matches because everything was everybody was closely matched. So there were very few blow-up matches. Everything was intense and, and, and a lot of fun and a lot of joking around. Best of three? Sorry? All best of best three. Best of three as well, yeah. Best of three. Um, and if I'm not mistaken... It might have been sudden death. I can't remember if we played, you know, winner winner by two. But I think this idea of sudden death, mm. you just first to 11, I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what you ran two, there were two or three of them went there and then obviously lockdown. lockdown. Yeah, then obviously lockdown happened. I mean, the other thing I've done is um, I ran a f- two or three 24-hour squash thons for around the time of comic relief. Mm. Um, various different events. So, you know, we had a double fancy run that ran overnight. And again, we had about 20 people involved in that playing squash in the middle of the night for about four, four, four or five hours. And again, it was just about having fun. And everyone had fun. Um, you know, we even had Marwin and El Shivagi turn up to yeah. play with uh, Karina Taima and they, they, they trashed everybody, but they had a good time. You know, who, who expects to have world number three at the time? I think mean, he was turning up for your uh, squash lawn. It was fantastic. Brilliant. So, so, I mean, where do these initiatives have to be taking place in your mind? Because obviously you talked about the clubs going down their independent routes and then obviously with, you know, as, uh, sitting on the, on the county board, we're trying to influence things, but and then you've got obviously the NGB England squash sitting above this, but where do you feel the biggest driver of change needs to come from? Is it a club level, county level, national level, or is it on the the onus on the individual? What you know to to spark change and bounce back from this COVID scenario? What what where do we need to what do we need to do? I think it's ultimately club club level. I'm, 
I think what's one of the things that I notice is that too often we're looking at the level above us to solve the problems. So at county level, we're looking at English squash to solve the problems. At club level, the clubs are looking at the counties to solve the problems. Counties don't have money. All we can do at a county level is provide ideas and templates for how to do events. Ultimately, it needs somebody, an ambassador in each of the clubs who goes, I can buy into this. And if I get support from my county or from other people, then I'm willing to do the work. Um, and we need at county level to make that easy for the clubs to do. Um, and I don't think we've been very good at doing that. Um, when I when I joined, I don't think there was very good communication from the county to the clubs. So it's no wonder the clubs aren't willing to engage backwards with the county. Mm. Um, and that's just you know that's that's no one's fault. That's just the nature of the beast. I think at 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 county level we have to be very 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 good at communicating with our clubs and showing them that we are active, that we've got ideas, that we want to help people to implement these ideas. And we're not saying that our ideas are perfect, but they're at least something to try. So I think it is a combination, you know, ultimately it's going to come down to are the clubs willing to participate, are the clubs willing to put in the effort. But if we aren't at county level willing to throw out ideas, willing to throw out programs to say, here's how we can support you. We're not going to be able to give you all the money, but we support you with ability, personal ability, marketing ability, spreading the good good news that's come out of those events so that other clubs, other people can see what's going on. Then we might start getting some engagement. You know, when I'm hearing university students saying, if you tell us about stuff that's going on at other clubs, we'll go and support them. Once clubs see that happening, then they're going to be more willing to go and support somebody else's stuff. Mm. You know, when when I started squash, I, I I did this back in Canada, and we used to have five or six tournaments in in my city, St. Catharines. We all went around and supported each other's tournaments. We didn't go. Oh, I'm only going to play my own club's tournaments. So there's a big community that went around and just supported whatever was going on. And I think that's what we need to do in, in Avon is certainly create this idea of a community that is bigger than just a club. Um, and, and that comes down to community, communicating downwards, providing real leadership. And, and it's taken time for me to put in stru- place structures to be able to start doing that. And I'm hoping that after we come out of COVID that we can really start demonstrating that we have the expertise, that we have ideas, that we have the capability to support the clubs doing what maybe they'd like to do but feel afraid to do so 100 percent. and i mean so there's a couple of counties doing particularly good things at the moment i know we've we've chatted to them um over over the last period and they have development officers um involved in the county do you think that's that's important again that's obviously dependent on funding right um, most definitely. I mean, we, we've we been looking at the idea of a development officer now for three or four years and kind of took the, the approach that we didn't want to touch our cash reserves to do that. And we couldn't rely on funding development officer out of you know, squash grant funding because that's just not going to be reliable going forward. It needs to be self-funding from a recurrent stream. And we, as a result of that, we kind of went, oh, well, it's not possible. We don't have funding in place. Recently, we've kind of taken a, a different approach where can we get something off off the ground part-time and build from from that um, and we've looked at the middle sex model of how they've done that and that's something that we're looking to try and implement over the next two or three months to start building a way of putting a development officer in place part-time but based from a recurring stream of funding and then from that can we make it a full-time position for somebody you know, even even if that's sharing that resource with another county. So here in the Southwest, our regional form is, is one that doesn't work um, for various reasons. But there have been overtures where it looks like there's some possibility of working with a couple of other counties, and particularly in the area of marketing, where that might be able to start kicking off again, where we can share the resources and effort in trying to market our game in a completely different way. Mm. And um, what about kind of 
the funding structures then how is that shifted for because presumably there's less money in the sport england squash used to have a huge number of staff and i know their number their staffing has been reduced so you know what's yeah can you talk us through that kind of knock-on effect and the the history of that and how that how that funding did filter down to county level or you know how how counties were traditionally funded and how that's shifted now so counties were traditionally funded from the england squash grant which was you know money that was given to them by government by a sport england whatever and um, what England Squash did was they used to funnel that money out into re- into the regions. So there used to be a southwest region, northwest, whatever. And then the regions would decide how they wanted to spend that money. And that money would be earmarked for things like talent development or general development of the game. So elite development or general development of the game. Years ago, there used to be money that would could be used to help for court refurbishments or court repairs or to buy you know, mini squash balls, squash balls or equipment, all that's gone. None of that exists anymore. We maybe get um, per year something like maybe £3,000 a year at a county level that we can spend on things like development of some elite players or elite coaches or funding some of our programs that we're doing, things like women's only programs or, you know, providing equipment for juniors and things like that. The amount of money that's come to us is is very little. What English Squash then did was institute this rebate where some of the some of the personal fees that went. So if you wanted to be a a league player, you had to register and pay like twelve hundred a year to English Squash, and each club had to pay a certain amount of money to be affiliated. And in return for that, we get some money back from English Squash out of that pot of money, which is based on number of courts and number of players. So, you know, we get like four or five percent of that money back every year. Um, and for us, that could be seven to eight, a huge amount. Um, so now we have to start looking at how else can we start funding our, our activities. So we are looking at, um, you know, who can, who can we work with sponsors? And as you know, we started working with Squash Girls, um, as, a, as our main county sponsor. Um, and we're looking at, okay, you know, what other types of sponsors can we start bringing on board, you know, at tournament level, maybe to its, to sponsor individual specific programs. There are other grants available. Um, you can, things like, um, I don't know if you've heard of the satellite club funding grant. So this is a program that's aimed at kind of like the secondary school aged children where they can set up a squash club in their school, but then be affiliated with a local squash club. So it's like, if Workout is the main club, these kids can create a satellite club in their school, but be linked to a main club. So there's funding for things like that, and there's quite a bit of funding. My understanding is um, from about 18 months ago that squash did some statistics, came out of that, and something like, it was less than 5% of grant funding went to any squash related activity at all. So we're not even making use of applications that are out there. Mm. Partly that's because we don't know about them. No one's done the research as to what's available, um, you know, whatever. Um, a lot of them are targeted at, at charities. So a lot of the counties are going down the charitable route, becoming a charitable and corporate organiza- organizations, which we you know, we're doing it even now we're going through our process of, of having our application um, vetted and hopefully we'll get that sorted out in the next few weeks. Mm. That in itself should open up, you know, wider ranges of funding. But I think it's, it's you know, if you look at us at the committee level, we don't have anybody on committee, for example, who has specialist knowledge in, in dealing with fundraising. So we don't have that. Somebody can come on and go, I know how to raise money. Okay. And this is how we should do it, you know, to break down the traditional ways of looking at funding. And I think that's probably true of a lot of, you know, a lot of people who are running organizations is they don't run them like a business. So it's volunteers who are passionate about the game, trying to fill in jobs that they really don't, don't really know how to do. You really need to have people on who know how to do marketing, who know how to do fundraising, who know how to do legal stuff. They should be in charge of your committee, running your committee. 
Yeah. You know, that's that's the way to do stuff. And so we need to change our whole mental attitude about how to promote our sport, how to run it, to really run it like a business, even if it isn't. Well, fundamentally, I, I, what I'm hearing is that, you know, there's a lack of funding at the moment at the grassroots level. There's pockets of, you know, some successful clubs like Pontefract, for example, you know, it's a fantastically run club with an amazing community, but it's a successful business behind it and that's what then facilitates the community that's what facilitates the nice bar you know and success breeds success in that sense doesn't it but it yeah feel like a, a grassroots level kind of generally a, a squash courts and venues around the country we've got to find a way of raising some money finding some money people putting their hands in their pockets to support the growth of the game but then we need this enthusiasm within the club don't we it's got to be fun and engaging um and and it's those characters at those venues that are, are crucial as much as anything isn't it you know that yeah uh, and i think you know if i look in my county <coughs> the clubs where that where they're going to find that the most difficult are the ones where they are in in constant leisure centers where the, where sometimes the relationship isn't great between the club and the leisure center mm. where the leisure center aren't interested largely because they're understaffed or they have a high turnover of staff. So even if you do get somebody who's really engaged with squash, in three months' time, they may have moved on. So these clubs really, really struggle to create any sort of atmosphere that's like a club that we know and yeah. understand. And it kind of makes me think that that kind of model of courts and leisure centers is probably not sustainable. Mm. Um, one of the things that I encountered when I was playing cricket in Canada, there was in Toronto, there was a, a guy who decided that what he was going to do was set up a venue that could host six matches at once. So you, you think amount of space that's required. So he just bought a whole bunch of land just outside the city, just on the northern parts of the city, created a big clubhouse and effectively created a venue where clubs could call their home. And he looked after the venue. And so obviously they're paying some sort of fee to be part of there, but maybe we need to start looking at, can we create in our major centers, large facilities where there's loads of lot courts, but all our clubs or the, you know, the ones who are really struggling are clubs within the venue. So maybe they have their own bar, maybe they have their own little club thing. And they don't have to worry about creating two courts. There are courts available but they're centralized and under one kind of like one roof. Mm. And that's not to say we get rid of the, the, the Redlands and the Lansdowns and the workouts, the ones where you, you have a, a thriving atmosphere and a thriving club, but the leisure centers where they're struggling to get the courts repaired, where the heating's not great, where the courts are freezing, they can't stay beyond a period of time to have a party or, or, or even stay in the bar. You have to go outside the club to, to get to the bar. These are all barriers to having social fun events. Yeah. So can we create a, a space where we can put the courts in, create a club-like atmosphere that is for these people? And I think that's maybe a model that we need to start looking at and going down. And again, yes, that takes money, but it's in the long term, we then don't have to worry about, is that leisure center going to close? Are we going to lose the courts to Zoom or some salsa class or whatever? You know. When was the last squash court built in Avon? Out of interest. New one. Yeah. Possibly UE. Right. When they built their courts. Um, I know I know, for example, Workout had brand new courts rebuilt. So they tore down the old ones and built new ones. Mm -hmm. um, but they were kind of like replacement. No, I, I tell a lie. Um Whitchurch um down in um near Knoll had their court. Um but they rebuilt two courts to completely rebuild them when we thought we might lose them completely yeah so they were rebuilt we've had no new courts you know <coughs> built out of nothing yeah um yeah. i went on a tour to france years ago and we went to a club and, and that was a private members club where they built the club on their own mm. they started with one court and they added a second court and they eventually built four courts all glass back in a purpose-built venue, nice little bar, nice changing rooms, um, but it's all members-owned, mm. and that's what they did.
and then they slowly, slowly over time, added in maybe a small gym and built on top of that. They didn't rely on um, a leisure center putting their stuff in for them. Mm. That's interesting. It's unlocking the funding, though. Again, isn't it? It's all, uh, it's all money. It yeah. is, but it's all money. But again, you know, courts are disappearing. So what's happening to the glass back? What's happening to the walls? What's happening to the tin? What's happening to the floor? Can we not get hold of all that material and at least refurbish it and, and start using it again instead of losing it? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, well, when we're coming up to coming up to the hour mark now. It's um, been fascinating talking to you. Um, give us a reason to be optimistic then in the squash world at the moment, Seamus. And uh, you know, what do we need to be do? What are the opportunities in this? You know, when we do all get back on court here in the UK and why should we be optimistic and where, where does the effort need to go in to, to really help us bounce back in your opinion? Well, people want to play. I mean, I've come across loads of people who have never played the game before and managed to try it before the last lockdown and are just so enthusiastic about it. Um, people want to have social interaction and I think our sport, the way that we party afterwards is absolutely perfect for that kind of getting people together mm. um the way that we can joke around the way that we can have fun on court um i think that's glorious the fact that it is indoors and we're not dependent on having clean nice weather is also great and people are fun to be with squash players are actually a lot of fun to be with they enjoy so much being social and so much interacting with other people by and large i mean obviously there are those who aren't um and we've got the we've got the facilities they just need to be used yeah we've got people who want to coach who want to help people get better um you know we've got great club nights and we've got a chance to actually people who haven't been able to do stuff who've been locked away we've got a chance to showcase our sport as something that's easy cheap to get on and get used and and to do Perfect. Well, yeah, good stuff. Well, I look forward to see working with you closely on uh, on the you know getting back on court collectively in Avon uh, over the next period. But you know, once again, thanks for your time today. Uh, really insightful. Hopefully, it offers up some some useful information to other people who are you know in similar situations um, involved with the game at a grassroots level across the country, across the world. Um, and hopefully, collectively, we can all pull together to to see the game bounce back as we as we hope it will as we hope it will. But yeah, thanks for your time, and we'll. Oh, uh, thanks for having me.